absolutely everywhere. For me, when I'm working on a book, um, the veil between my real life and my writing life is completely porous so that everything that I see and think and feel and do is fodder for the book. Research is a continual process for me. Um, I always write about things that interest me as a person, so I could easily get lost down one of the research rabbit holes and never write a word of fiction. They all come together. At the beginning of the process, I sit down with a fresh notebook and a pen, and it's in my mind, it's like there's this trunk into which over the years I've thrown all the little tiny idea fragments that I haven't been able to use so far. Little things that interest me or stick in my mind. Some are character related, some are setting related, some are plots or plot twists, and I sort through them, and as I do that, uh, some of them just seem to belong together and as I scribble notes and ask myself questions this picture builds and it's almost like a conjuring process as this story sort of rises from the page and in my imagination almost as if it, it really happened rather than um, it's, that it's being invented um, by me. Generally, I write in the order that you read, so um, past to present, past to present, rather than keeping um, separate storylines. And I find that for me, that's the most intuitive way to write. I can sort of feel when it's time to switch into a different timeline. Uh, but actually, with The Clockmaker's Daughter, uh, it was the first time that I did things differently. And that's because from the very beginning, I was quite clear that I wanted um, to write about layers of time within the one house. And I knew that I wanted to have these separate little um, snapshots almost of different lives um, of people who'd lived within Birchwood Manor over time. And so I had all of their different stories open in different files at the same time on my computer. And I would dip into one because I, you know, it might feel like a Juliet day. And then the next week I'd be, you know, it's time for Leonard. And by doing that, I was able to um, sort of find the silvery threads that um, tie between those storylines even though they appear as quite seemingly discrete stories within the book and I actually wrote the overarching Birdie Bell narrative at the very end which um, worked for me because that way I um, like Birdie was already privy to all of the different um, things that had happened for the other characters along the way. The more I write, the more convinced I am that character drives story. So it's really important to me to create characters who live and breathe uh, for me and hopefully by extension for you. Um, but although I fear it might sound heartless, um, when I'm writing a book, you know, the world of those characters is so vivid and alive. It's almost like I create this bubble that I live inside and, and everything that I see and think and feel uh, relates in some way to the, the world of these characters. But when I reach the end of the story, that bubble seals and it floats away and it's not mine anymore, it's yours and those characters um, belong to you, which is okay because it's at that exact moment that um, I start opening the new bubble and uh, meeting new characters who become every bit as um, vivid and real as the ones I've had to let go. There was one stage towards the very end of the process where I thought how nice it would be to reunite them, but I just loved the idea and it felt completely right that um, Birdie Bell and the house should be one. That's a great question. And um, in The Clockmaker's Daughter, I would have to say that it's all of the characters but for the same reason. Um, 
something that ties the characters in The Clockmaker's Daughter is that they are all um, people across time who for different reasons um, arrive at the house uh, seeking refuge of a sort because they've all experienced some kind of loss and they're uh, sort of craving, I suppose, a sense of belonging, uh, a sense of um, home. And um, I was really uh, inspired by that idea that even in times of darkness it's possible to find light. And um, I guess that's a type of resilience and it's one that all of the characters in The Clockmaker's Daughter um, exhibit and share. <laughs> That's an easy one. Um, definitely Enid Blyton. She was my first great love. Um, I discovered her when I was four years old. Uh, the first book I had was The Enchanted Wood and then The Faraway Tree and then when I discovered a love for mystery it was The Famous Five and The Secret Seven and I'm of the firm belief that the books that you read as a child really do become a part of the landscape um, of your imagination uh, that's every bit as vivid as the landscape, uh, the geographical landscape outside the window and I know that I am still drawn to books as a reader and as a writer that are about um, or set in cottages on the edge of deep, dark, mysterious woods. Well, I think everybody loves stories. I think that's just a fact of our programming as human beings. And as far as books are concerned, um, it's surely just a matter of uh, showing children that those typewritten pages are actually doorways through which they can slip disappear into other worlds whenever they so choose. Uh, with my own kids, I've found that the best way to show them that is, um, simple as it sounds, by reading to them. I've never met a child who doesn't want to be um, told a story. Mm. Nancy Mitford, because she'd be fun, and I'm gonna say Annabelle Crabbe for the same reason and because she can cook. <laughs>